Last week, we traveled to Madrid to speak with the new chancellor of Germany, Olaf Scholz, during a week of international meetings among top U.S. allies who are faced with a growing list of problems, including rising food and energy prices exacerbated by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Chancellor Schultz is one of the few European leaders who still speaks to Vladimir Putin. So that's where we started our conversation. When you speak to Putin, does he acknowledge the sanctions? Does he acknowledge how much his economy has been hurt? Or does he just not care? I think he cares, but he will not really admit it. So you get some... Because it idea, hasn't stopped him. You get some idea that it really is hurting him and that he understands the deep impacts of our sanctions on his economy. And uh, I'm always mentioning it because it's necessary to say it. This is now happening to a country that is not that advanced, that is really needing all the technologies from the rest of the world for having a similar standard of living and for having the chance to be part of a growth in the world economy. And this is now the real damage to the Russian economy, that they have no chance to do this. When will Putin run out of weapons, run out of funds? Or can he, this continue for years? No one really knows. He, has, uh, he is, he is uh, the, hat, the leader of a very great country with uh, a lot of people living there, with uh, a lot of means. And he is really doing this brutal war with uh, and, and he prepared for it. So he will be able to continue with the war really a long time. Do you believe that Vladimir Putin will stop at Ukraine? I think that all what we do will help to give him the view that this is not working and that he will not be successful. Your country has earned this reputation of over-promising and under-delivering when it comes to Ukraine. Ukraine received its very first delivery of German howitzers, this artillery, last week. Why did it take that long? We're in the fifth month. So we took a very, very hard decision to change political strategies we followed for many decades, right. never to deliver weapons into a country that is in a conflict. When we decided, for instance, to send the most modern howitzer, which you can buy on the mm -hmm. world market, which is in use in Germany, um, it was very difficult to organize that this could be used in the war because you have to have some training. And we had Ukrainian soldiers in Germany and when the training ended, in the end they came with the weapon, with, uh, with the howitzers to Ukraine and they but are now But the United use. States is doing that. They're providing weaponry within 48 hours sometimes of the president signing and carrying out training. Why I did think, it take this long for Germany? I think you should understand that there is a difference if a country like the United States spends that much for defense, which mm -hmm. is a very big investment, mm -hmm. and you have a lot of uh, weapons at your stocks. Together with the United States, and the United Kingdom, we decided to deliver um, multi-rocket launches to Ukraine now, which are... Those haven't been delivered yet. We are sending them and we are doing it with the means and ways we have and with the training. And once again, I, there are a lot of very experienced people who yesterday looked at Google and today they know how to th do things. But I will tell you there are weapons where you have to have your training and you have, it, have to have it... Uh, not in Ukraine, you have to have it here in, in our countries. And so we will always see that Germany is one of the countries that is doing the most because what we are sending now is the most sophisticated technology you can mm -hmm. use. There is also anti ballistic, uh, there are also uh, weapons we give to the, uh, to the Ukraine that they can defend the air. The anti-aircraft missiles you the, promised, the anti radar. No, no, no they, they can defend a city from against uh, the, the rockets and missiles mm -hmm. that were sent there from Putin. And this is very expensive and very effective technology, but they will get it. The delays have led to speculation that it's not about getting the supplies. It's about the will of the government to actually deliver them. Um, and whether there's fear of provoking Putin or whether it's years of budget cuts to your defense industry that have made it just not possible for the German military to act quickly. How do you respond to that? Those who are looking to the facts see that we are doing what is feasible. We are changing the way how we spend money for defense. And mm -hmm. this is 
the big increase which will change the situation and will give us the chance to be more quick in reaction to a threat that is coming to NATO, the alliance or to our country. Germany is providing about two billion in aid to Ukraine. That's roughly what you spend per month on gas from Russia, on coal, on energy supplies. So while you're helping the Ukrainians financially, you're also essentially giving Vladimir Putin a financial lifeline. He cannot buy anything from the money he's, he's getting from us because he, will, he has all these sanctions on imports for modern technologies and things he is looking for. So this is what is making very angry. But to be very clear, when we decided on sanctions together and with all our allies, we said always we will do it in a way that we harm Putin more than us. Mm -hmm. And many countries in Europe are depending for historical reasons and because they are near to the place and it is the nearest place to get the gas on the imports of gas. And when now whole Europe is deciding to go out of this uh, dependence, this will change the scenario even on the world market. But well, Vladimir Putin can use that money elsewhere, uh, just not in the West. But so he cannot is buy... Is it still two billion a month that Germany is sending to Russia? It is always decreasing and we draft the sanctions in a way that they hurt Putin and this is what we do. And once again, we are now doing real investments into technology, in pipelines, in ports. Mm -hmm. And I know there are people that sometimes think that uh, when you are having taken a decision one afternoon, the next morning you have a port and a 40 kilometers pipeline. Oh, it takes but time. in the real t life, this is not happening. When Europe is deciding to go out of the import of, of gas from Russia, mm -hmm. this will have consequences. It'll have you. I mean, this is the equivalent of them declaring war on you this by is, cutting gas supplies to Germany. This isn't just your choice. They're using that as a weapon against you. This is obviously the case, and this is why I was starting to discuss the question what to do if the gas delivery will be reduced right when I entered office. We should be very much prepared that we will have high, high energy prices all over the world in all countries. So Germany's uh, heavy industry association, BDI, warned a halt in Russian gas deliveries would make recession inevitable. It is not, an, it will be very tough if we will have uh, a shortage of energy supplies. Obviously all our countries, all our, all, all our life is depending on, on the supply of energy. And uh, obviously a lot of countries, the most countries of the world are depending on the supply from abroad. And so we have to prepare for a difficult situation. Vladimir Putin is, is weaponizing inflation. He's weaponizing food. Is he right to bet that he can fracture the Western alliance by making it harder for Europeans and Americans and everyone else to afford food in these months ahead? You are very right. The shortages of food many people in the world are seeing now as a threat to them are the direct consequence of what Russia's aggression against Ukraine and the war he is imposing on the country. You are right that uh, all the rising energy prices are also a direct consequence of his doing. And he is, he is the one that is, is doing the wrong things. And we are always discussing this with our partners on the globe. We are starting an initiative to support countries that have not enough food with food. If you can't reopen the Black Sea ports, if Putin doesn't agree to let the food out of Ukraine, how do you lower global food prices? We are now collecting money for supporting the poorest countries that they will be able to deliver food to their people. And this is our international initiative. We, we organize together with others for food security and we will continue to do that. But it risks global instability. It is a real problem and it is a real consequence of Putin's war. And this is why it is even more necessary that we support the people. So it also puts pressure to end this conflict sooner. What is your timeline for when this can end? The conflict will end when Putin understands that he will not be successful with the idea to just to conquer part of the territory of his neighbor. Members of the German government have admitted it was a mistake to be so dependent on Russia for so long. I think it was not right that we were not prepared to have at any time the chance 
to change the one that is delivering gas, oil and coal to us. So we should have invested all over Europe in an infrastructure that gives us the ability to change the supply mm -hmm. from one day to the other. And I think this is the lesson that has been learned in Europe and in many other places that you have to prepare, be prepared for a situation like this. President Biden also talks about this potential conflict between democracies and autocracies. Is that the biggest threat on the horizon? We should be clear about these threats that are coming to, to our future. And this is coming from autocracies, yes, mm -hmm. because they tend to be aggressive. And this is an aspect we should be very much aware of, and I am. And this is why I organized our meeting we had in, in Germany with the D7 group of democratic, economically successful democratic states, that we invite partners from all over the globe that are also democracies for making it happen that the democracies are strong. Mm -hmm. And by strong, it also comes with 100,000 US troops in Europe and 300,000 NATO response forces in Europe. This isn't just diplomacy, this is muscle. This is, and it's necessary. Mr. Chancellor, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you. Our full interview is on our website and our YouTube channel. We'll be back in a moment. Leaders at the G7 last week pledged an additional $4.5 billion to address what the Secretary General of the United Nations is calling an unprecedented global hunger crisis. But aid organizations are warning it won't be enough, as Russia's war in Ukraine severs supply lines and inflation continues raging. CBS News foreign correspondent Deborah Pata is in South Sudan with this report. Hunger is a never-ending season in South Sudan. For three years, this country has been battered by one climate change shock after another. Apocalyptic flooding in the north, crippling drought in the southeast. Millions were already starving. Then came the war in Ukraine, triggering the UN's biggest humanitarian crisis this century as food and fuel prices soared, tipping this country over the edge. In wheat, floodwaters have still not receded. I'm standing in a place where people used to live. These were their homes. This was the land that they used to cultivate and live off. And now it's completely submerged underwater. Sarah Nyawal's entire village is gone. She has nothing to eat but the water lilies she's collecting. In the community of Canal PG, every child brought to nutritionist Mona Sheikh during our visit was severely malnourished. I'm afraid, you know, any child like that, we are very close to losing them really? within days. There was Nyanjima Gatlak, who walked for over a month to get food for her weak and listless eight-month-old baby Kang. And Nyobani Kong, who's already lost one child to hunger and hasn't eaten for two weeks. Her mother-in-law, Nyakoni, is wasting away. Battling almost impossible odds, the World Food Program is doing its best. But since Russia invaded Ukraine, their costs have risen exponentially. She was telling WFP's Marwa Awad says they've been forced to suspend aid to nearly 2 million of the 6 million people they feed here. Uh, we're having to do humanitarian triage. This is the worst thing that any humanitarian or aid worker has to do. We must do something to help. Subsistence farmer Nachapara Lemuria's own mother starved to death. This was her last bag of food rations for the year. It will be finished in two weeks. Just tell the world we need food, she implored. And when you visit again, she said, we will smile and tell stories of how we survived and find ways to help others in need. No one should die of hunger. There's enough food to feed everyone on earth. The stories we heard continue to haunt us. The people of South Sudan, the world, must not forget. Deborah Pata reporting in South Sudan. We'll be right back. According to the Gates Foundation, the maternal mortality rate is higher here 
than in any other developed country. And the elimination of federal protection for abortion rights only underscores that reality and the risks ahead. Dr. Henning Tiemeyer is the director of the Maternal Health Task Force at Harvard University, and he joins us now. Good morning to you, doctor. Hello, Margaret, and good morning. Good morning. I think this is incredibly important because I want to put the issue of abortion itself aside for a moment and talk about pregnancy in America as these states rewrite these laws. So how is it possible that in the richest country in the world, we have the highest maternal mortality rate, and how do we stop it from getting worse? Well, I have to say two things to that. First of all, there seems to be an issue with the data. We think it's higher than in other developed countries, so it is higher. But some of the uptick we've seen recently is, is partly due to poor data collection. So that has been corrected, but it is higher. So why is it higher? Um, we think that has to do with the general health of women in America. So it is a background risk, and it is partly due to poverty, to poor healthcare during pregnancy, and importantly, poor care after pregnancy, after delivery. It, the mortality rate among black mothers is three times higher than white women. Why? That is correct. It is much higher. It is substantially higher. And um, it is, you must understand that there's about 700 women dying during or after labor or in the first months after delivering 700 per year, and we know that most of these deaths are preventable. And they indeed occur in minorities more often, and in particular in black women. And why that is, is essentially one of the biggest challenges of public health. And we see that at the top of the iceberg of poor health in women and poor health in black women. And there are several reasons. There seems to go from poverty to discrimination to poor care for this group of women. So according to the CDC, nearly 40% of all abortions uh, performed in this country happen among black women. So in laying out what you did, um, I would base the assumption that you are projecting that the death rate for these mothers will also climb? I don't think we have good projections in numbers at the moment, because that will depend on many of the issues, actually, that you touched on before, on the legal issues, on the access to abortion in other mm -hmm. states. But we know that abortion occurs in people of poverty and in minorities much more often. We know that they have difficulties to access abortion outside the state. So we think it will impact their physical and mental health. How many deaths? Nobody knows. It is yeah. very hard. It will, it will, it's, I wouldn't want to quantify that. No. I couldn't put a number. Um, it depends on so many other things. Um, yeah. So, you know, we looked at um, Medicaid coverage in this country. It covers about 40% of all births in the country. And the federal government is trying to get states to take more money to extend maternal health care. So it's not just cut off at two months, but it goes for longer. So women can get pelvic exams and they can get other things after they give birth. States like Mississippi aren't doing that. What's the consequence if you don't have access to health care after two months? So what you're pointing out now is one of the big issues and one of the things that could be addressed quickly. Um, there are numerous states. Mississippi is one of them, but don't forget Texas is another one, and that counts in big numbers, that have not expanded, as we say, Medicaid. They have not accepted the Affordable Care Act offer to expand health care to women in the first year. And I would actually say it should go further than that in the first year after delivery. That means that you have very little right and very little coverage. So only the very, very poor in these states are covered, but a big number of poor women, of relatively poor, low-income women, women that struggle to make the time and the money to be insured, um, are not covered for things like mental health, physical checks ups, even um, so they will not have the pelvic examinations that are needed. You're right. So America looks a lot different now than it did in 1973. Brookings says about 40 percent of U.S. households have women as the prime breadwinner. So I want to ask you how important it is um, in your view from a medical perspective that women 
be able to take recovery time after childbirth. Uh, because, of course, as you know, in this country, there is no federal guarantee of paid family leave. So if these women have to work to support their family, their job's in question, essentially, or at least being paid for it. I think this is such an important issue. It's, in a way, under-recognized. I know that the vice president addressed some of this. But it is very important to see that we need many measures to improve maternal health. Uh, one of them would be to improve the prenatal care, and the other is indeed to improve postnatal care, but also to support families. And it is in particular poor, disadvantaged families, buying them time. So giving them leave, paid leave, is very important because having a child is a stress on the system. Imagine you have three children, you yeah. have a fourth one, then you need, you know, if you're making a minimum loan, you will not manage to to make your ends meet. You will not find yes. the time to breastfeed. We see that breastfeeding mm -hmm. is, is not going up as we wished it would um, right. because of this. So I argue Doctor. yes, and many of my colleagues, that we need time. Yes. And we will continue to cover your research. Thank you. We'll cover those issues on this program as well. I have to leave it there, though. So we'll be back in a moment. Here in the nation's capital, we are surrounded with reminders of the challenges our forefathers faced in times of great conflict here at home and abroad. There are tributes to those who fought for America's freedom from tyranny, to those who led Americans through some of its darkest times in our 246-year-old history. There are collections of the histories of oppressed minorities who fought for equal footing among their fellow Americans, and monuments to the titans who fought for equality and justice fight that continues to this very day. Sprinkled throughout, there are bits of wisdom from these giants. When we look at them today, one might think that maybe they knew where we were headed. They seek to establish systems of government based on the regimentation of all human beings by a handful of individual rulers. Call this a new order. It is not new, and it is not order. We can gather strength from looking back as we struggle to go forward. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan. Happy Fourth of July.